When discussing character action games, the last thing one would think to discuss and or criticize would be the narrative and characters. But I'm here to do just that, because while I totally agree that when it comes to these types of games, the focus is more on high octane action and spectacle and engaging combat and bosses, I also firmly believe that having a good story and good characters make these games all the better. It's the reason why games like Devil May Cry 3 are remembered so fondly and are still beloved by the community, whereas a game like DMC Devil May Cry, while perfectly fine as a game, doesn't exactly hold up just as well. Because especially for fans of the franchise, this isn't Dante and this isn't Virgil. These characters simply don't stick the landing the same way the original characters did. It's the reason why you never see people getting hyped over DMC Virgil, but ever since his introduction proper in DMC 3, Virgil has remained a fan favorite and people absolutely lose their minds every time he's introduced in any special edition of a game, be that inside the franchise or outside. Because he's a charming character and he's written well and he's cool as hell. It's also in part the reason why, despite the memes, so many people loved Metal Gear Rising, because the story is good, the characters are fun. People wouldn't be loving Raiden or Jetstream Sam as much if they were written poorly. And if characters and story truly didn't matter in these games, this wouldn't be happening. I'm talking about all this because I wanted to talk about Bayonetta 3 and how it utterly fails its characters. Because Bayonetta 3 doesn't just have a bad story. Bayonetta 3 has a story that actively tries its hardest to be the worst one yet and affects not only the previous games, but any future games going forward. I'm a very big Bayonetta fan, and Bayonetta 3 was a game that I was expecting excitedly, just like all other Bayonetters like me. And it's because I'm a big Bayonetta fan that this was extremely disappointing. Bayonetta 1 and 2 didn't exactly have the best of stories, but at least they were decent enough and had good and fun characters and antagonists. But with the release of Devil May Cry 5, which is not only a love letter to its franchise, but also raised the bar for gameplay and story in character action games, suddenly the pressure was up for Platinum to deliver in a similar light, at least in my eyes. But unfortunately, not only does Bayonetta 3 not come close at all to the same level as DMC 5, it doesn't even come close to the level of its previous two games. Bayonetta 3 attempts to mesh together a multiversal story alongside a passing of the torch story, but also trying to give the main character a story of her own all at the same time, and fails completely at each of these things entirely. The game, whether intentional or not, is very similar to DMC5, and I think this is something we can all agree on. DMC5, and to some extent DMC4, similarly have a passing of the torch style story too, where a new character gets introduced, in this case, Nero. But whereas DMC actually does the right thing and makes the games mostly focused on Nero with Dante also riding along, acting as a mentor of sorts, Bayonetta 3 wants to have its cake and eat it too by giving Bayonetta the spotlight instead of giving Viola the spotlight. And whereas DMC5 actually executes his story very well, while juggling three different characters going through their own arcs during the events of the game that all intertwine with each other, Bayonetta 3 doesn't execute this nearly as well. Both Nero and Viola are introduced as the more hot-headed and less experienced version of the main character. They have a lot less self-control and strength, and they screw up a lot. But whereas Nero in Devil May Cry messes up, and he messes up a lot, he slowly built up throughout his games and slowly makes more progress until his eventual glory moment at the very end of the game. In DMC4, after Nero regains the Yamato, he's finally able to stand up to Sanctus and destroy him all alone in a final triumphant moment. It's a very satisfying moment after all the losses Nero suffers throughout the game, and it's a significant moment for his character where he comes to accept his demonic side rather than reject it and treat it as shameful. This is executed even better in DMC5, where Nero doesn't need the Yamato anymore as his source of power, and after meeting his father for the first time, and after all the losses he suffered throughout his life, knowing the only family he has left are going to end up killing each other, that motivation to save both of them finally awakens his true demonic powers, as Nero unlocks his devil trigger for the first time, and even grows a normal arm back. It's a very cool and awesome moment for us as fans, and it's narratively significant for the character. There's a reason for this happening, and it's properly built up to in both of his games. Viola's introduction is fine enough, and I actually really liked her initially. She looks like she'd be the serious, brooding type, but she's actually very talkative and extroverted, and kinda goofy, but with a sense of urgency. 
Unfortunately, her character doesn't go past that, and it very quickly begins to fall apart the more the game treats her as comic relief rather than an actual character. Viola's glorious moment where she awakens her true powers doesn't happen at the end of the game after a proper build-up. It instead randomly happens without any real prompt at the very middle of the game on a boss fight when she loses and seems to die. It just kind of happens. There's no real reason for it, there's no emotional weight or impact for her character narratively behind it all. And while Viola's new form is very cool, the game has no shortage of badass monster demon girls for your enjoyment if you're a weirdo like me that likes that kind of stuff, but it doesn't exactly make up for a moment that falls completely flat, and is preceded by Viola getting trapped under a bell and going on a quest for water in a giant desert like a Looney Tunes character. She also doesn't even win the fight either. In fact, Viola loses pretty much every single encounter in the game. Viola is repeatedly denied any moment of glory or any wins throughout the entire game, being relegated to a comic relief even until the very end of the game. And it's fine to have a character that is a bit of comic relief. Not a character that makes jokes, but a character who is the butt of the joke. But the game does absolutely nothing with that or Viola. The Viola you see at the beginning of the game is the same one you get at the end. She has no progress, she has no journey. The better way to have done this would be extremely simple. Make the game about Viola and her journey to become a better witch. Failing the first time on her own home world where her friends and family die in front of her as she's powerless to stop it. And build her up to eventually awaken her true powers at the end of the game once she sees it's about to happen again and she saves the day. The Viola at the end of the game would not only be more powerful, but also far more confident in herself and her skills. It's not a mind-blowing premise, but it's a premise that works, and it's good enough for a story. Instead, Viola ends up as a nothing character that watches helplessly as the villain destroys everything she knew, and then has to fight an evil version of her mom because... Oh, right. I completely forgot to mention that probably because I tried really hard to block this out of my mind. Bayonetta 3 also attempts to cram in some very awful romance between Bayonetta and Luca, who are also Viola's parents to absolutely nobody's surprise. Nobody asked for this, and it's implemented extremely badly. It's not even the good kind of cheesy bad romance, it's the actually badly written romance with a dialogue that makes you physically cringe and recoil when you hear it. It's also made all the worse and even kind of creepy when you realize that it's implied that this Cereza is this Cerecita from the first game. You know, the one who gets her name Cerecita and her liking of lollipops from Luca. Oh man. DMC has little snippets of romance in its games too. Kyrie and Nero are probably the most explicit example, but they're very, very small with things like Dante flirting with Lady and teasing a kiss in DMC 3 before both of them just kind of back up. It's cute and it's funny and it's very quick and feels in character for these two. You don't really know whether or not Dante was kidding or serious or just acting all cool and Lady turning her head makes sense. Bayonetta suddenly acting all cuddly and dreamy about Luca does not make sense. The words they exchange here come from nowhere. This relationship was not built up properly at all, especially when Luca was never really seen as a romantic interest for Bayonetta. Luca hated Bayonetta in the first game for killing her father, and in the second game, Luca is just kind of there, and Bayonetta teases him, sure, but she teases everyone. Romance in a Bayonetta game is probably more fitting than DMC, considering Bayonetta's character, but this just isn't the way to do it. And while I'm at it, since the game sidelines Viola for Bayo so much, maybe it's because Bayo has an interesting and meaningful journey throughout the game. No, not really. Bayonetta is just kind of there along for the ride in the game. For Bayonetta, there's no real personal stakes here other than the general issue of realities collapsing. The main villain isn't secretly Bayonetta's father, nor is one of the antagonists secretly one of Bayonetta's childhood friends. She also does a shit job at mentoring Viola, essentially telling her to get good and not actually teaching her how to control her powers better, or how to carry herself and have some kind of cute mother-daughter type moment. There's absolutely none of that. Bayonetta pretty much tells Viola to fuck off and go someplace else, and yet the game wants us to care about the relationship and all the other events in the game, even though they're written in a completely similar fashion. Compare this to Dante's journey in Devil May Cry 5. At this point, Nero has been introduced and the story of DMC5 is about as much Nero's as it is Dante's, considering Virgil is back and suddenly is wrecking shit up and erecting a giant structure yet again. The game not only opens up new possibilities for Dante with his newfound powers, but also gives Dante a satisfying closure to all the previous plot points, especially his relationship with Virgil, as they initially want to destroy each other blindly, but then sort of open their eyes and put their differences aside to solve the issue at hand, 
only to go back to fighting each other as brothers, having fun, not as enemies trying to kill each other. Not only does the game completely sideline Viola for Bayonetta, the game also seems to wrongly believe players loved Luca in previous games, because Luca is made to be such a huge part of this game, and I cannot explain why. Luca was alright in previous games, but he was never a key player. He was there to kind of info dump on Bayo with his journalistic skills, and always avoided danger and was kinda goofy. But here, he's a key character in the story. He's got powers, and you even meet an alternate version of Luca from a world where he's some kind of fairy god being or something. And this is literally never explained. This dude shows up out of absolute nowhere, and you only see him in like three cutscenes, and then he's gone, with absolutely no explanation and no elaboration at all. Which kind of encompasses the way the entire game is written. You'd think the game would give characters like Jean and Rodan something more to do, but no. Not only is Jean sidelined completely once again, and relegated to a fetch quest to find the Sigurd of their world to help fight the main villain of this game, only to later on die the most stupid and disrespectful death ever and never show up again. Rodan also does absolutely nothing, despite seemingly having the ability to travel through worlds, seeing as how he meets Bayonetta in the very first world you travel to, and this is especially disappointing when you remember Rodan actually helps out Bayo in Bayonetta 2, and it would have been fantastic to have Rodan as a partner in some levels, and also would have given him something to do other than hanging out in his bar doing absolutely nothing as realities are consumed. All the other Bayonettas don't fare much better either, unfortunately. Even the more interesting ones are only characters you meet for like 10 seconds before they die in front of you, and you get their weapons and hop onto the next world. It's a complete waste of the multiversal aspect of the story, and a complete waste of potentially interesting alternative versions of characters we know and love. The game really tries hard to make each of the Bayonetta's deaths tragic, and make the player feel bad, but it's kind of hard to feel bad for characters you haven't met for even 10 minutes, as interesting as they may seem. And when you get their weapons, and in some cases you have a hype epic fight with them, it's a bit hard to feel bad because you're being rewarded and hyped up by their deaths. Especially when some of these deaths are as dumb as the characters simply not turning around, which unfortunately happens more than once in the game. This would be completely different if you actually got to know each of them and form some kind of connection to them throughout the game or throughout their own levels, but this would imply that they'd have to actually think and put effort into writing compelling and charming versions of Bayonetta unique for each of them, aside from simply giving them an outfit and nationality change. So, I guess that makes sense. Even moments that should be emotional and compelling, like Cereza meeting her own mother in an alternate world, something that already happened and was actually done pretty well in Bayonetta 2, falls completely flat in this game and makes you think, oh well, that kinda sucks, but I get a sick new weapon though. And the other alternative versions of other characters aren't much better either. The only other genre we see is the one that doesn't really show up much on the first level, and the Egyptian one, which alongside the Egyptian Bayonetta are both really cool versions of these characters. But as soon as they get interesting and you want to see more of them and know them more, the level ends and they die as their reality is consumed. Which isn't really sad, it's just disappointing. There are other versions of Enzo in the game, but the one you actually meet up with is the one from the Paris level, who is an investigator searching for Bayonetta and Rosa. It's a fun, interesting dynamic, but again, it just sucks that as soon as it gets fun and interesting, it pulls the plug, and also has one of the stupidest deaths in the game. Hell, I wanted to see more of Viola's original world. Why not start us off with Viola there instead of Bayonetta? I wanted to see a bit more about this resistance group and the cool-ass guerrilla fighter Connor Sigurd. Maybe in a different world. Speaking of Sigurd, this leads me to probably the biggest disappointment of this game, which is the main villain. A villain that is literally actually nothing. Throughout the entire game, all our characters and other realities are hunted down and destroyed by Singularity, this mysterious entity that seems to want to unify all realities together and gain all their power. To end Singularity, they have to collect all the MacGuffins and find Dr. Sigurd. I can't really sugarcoat how stupid Sigurd is as a villain. Bayonetta as a franchise is no stranger to weird, cosmic, divine entities that want to destroy the world or gain power, and as characters are kind of bland and dull. But it was at least mitigated by the fact that it was mostly the final boss, and throughout the game you had interesting characters like Jean or Baldur, who acted as the iconic rival the main character would have. Hell, even Devil May Cry 4 didn't have a super compelling or interesting main villain, but at least you had Kratos or even Agnes, who was at least kind of funny. Even in DMC1 with Mundus, you at least had Phantom and Griffin, who had interesting personalities that clashed back and forth with Dante, whereas Mundus was a pretty regular big bad guy. 
In this game, there's none of that. Singularity is just this nebulous entity that haunts you throughout the entire game with absolutely no backstory or interesting personality to speak of. And also, I guess, he has powers that makes everyone in its vicinity stupider because characters die to Singularity because they don't turn around fast enough and can't notice that Dr. Sigurd is literally the exact same fucking color scheme as the main monsters and villain of the game. Can you imagine if Senator Armstrong or Jetstream Sam or Virgil were written in the same way? No charming personality, no interesting back and forth with the main character, no exchange of ideals, ideology, blah blah blah, no real motivation or anything like that. Just a bland, dull main villain that says generic main villain things and does generic main villain stuff. But hey, if you want to know more about them, you can read the codex, right? I wish I was joking, but no, this is probably the most insulting thing about this game. Pretty much any and all information there is about this guy and other characters are relegated to a page on a journal that you have to read. At this point, I feel like this shouldn't be said, but maybe don't put all the information about your character in the extra section and instead put it in the actual game. DMC similarly has extra information on all characters you can read on, but this is just general world building stuff or guides for the monsters and extra insight into the characters from the perspective of Nico. This isn't vital material that you should know, like the backstory and motivation of your main villain, which in this case is that he's an AI that one day rebelled and decided he wanted to do this now. Like I said, literally a nothing villain. And you know, that would be kind of fine by me if the villain wasn't the spotlight and instead the spotlight was about the heroes and their journey. But it's not like there's much to talk about there either. Once all realities are gone and all that's left is Viola, Bayonetta, Luca, and fucking Lucaeon who comes out of nowhere just to fuse with Luca and give him control over his powers, the final fight happens and all the other Bayonettas and even John come out to help One Singularity is weakened enough. Which is kind of hype, sure, but then they all just die immediately afterwards anyways. And Bayonetta also immediately loses anyways, so there was kind of no point to that. And that would be fine if the point was that Singularity is so strong that they do nothing to him, but the entire scene is made to be this glorious moment where they all come together to fight back and win. But no, despite showing them beating Singularity up, they still lose. And even Bayonetta still loses immediately afterwards as Viola watches. Which, this would be a great moment and opportunity for Viola to prove herself. You have a perfect parallel between this and the beginning of the game, where Viola watches helplessly as her mom dies in front of her and she's helpless to fight back. But now it's different. Now she's got all the power she needs. She won't let anyone else die anymore. Viola jumps into action and immediately loses. And just as Bayonetta and Viola are about to die, surprise, here comes Bayonetta 1 and Bayonetta 2. Why? Don't worry about it. But hey, doesn't this kind of ruin Bayonetta 1 and 2 by implying that 2 isn't a direct sequel to 1 but instead its own alternative world? Yes, yes it does. It's not like them being here matters anyway, as they both immediately eat shit and lose. Viola also tries to fight one more time, but also eats shit and loses again. I swear at this point, it's like the game is actively disrespecting Viola every chance it gets to. It's even funnier considering that after all Bayos combine into one and fight off Singularity, Viola tries to fight again, and she gets one single hit before immediately losing again. You can't make this shit up. Imagine if throughout DMC4 and DMC5, you mostly play as Dante rather than Nero, and Nero keeps losing every single fight up until the end where Dante steals what should have been his moment of glory, fighting off Virgil. That's exactly what happens here. Singularity should have been the Virgil to Viola's Nero, because it's Viola's story and journey. Hell, I'll go a step further and do the most obvious thing, which is make Luca the main fucking villain. What if Singularity was actually an evil, super powerful version of Luca that lost everything in his world and went insane? Sure, it's tropey, but at least it would be something. It would add something interesting to the dynamic of the antagonist and protagonist. So, after that mess of a situation, here comes Luca to save the day and be goofy and funny because that's exactly what we wanted and needed. This is when the game absolutely just loses its mind and the word truth starts getting dropped back and forth like it's a Kingdom Hearts game with darkness and light and hearts. All the characters talk about truth this and my truth that. It's like they realized the game was ending and the story said absolutely nothing so far so they tried to hurry and make up some dumb message about fighting for your own truth or whatever they were trying to go with as Bayonetta and Luca finish off Singularity, you know, instead of Viola. And after the grossest, most uncomfortable and awkward romance dialogue between a dying Bayonetta and Luca, the game fucking ends with Viola once again crying alone as everything she knew and loved is destroyed and that's a wrap. 
Our heroes have utterly failed in every possible aspect. None of their struggles was meaningful, and they lost. But the power of love triumphs. And roll fucking credits and a nice little dance sequence to wrap up this gorgeous passing of the torch story. But wait, because that's not everything. After the credits, we get the real ending, where Viola is now flying in the middle of nowhere as she fights off an evil Bayonetta remnant or something because. And finally proving herself worthy and learning her final lesson? What lesson? When did you start giving her lessons? This final interaction makes it seem like Viola has grown so much, but she's literally actually the exact same as she was in the beginning of the game. And the game actively shows this later on, when seemingly in a repaired and fixed reality, Viola walks up to Rodan's bar looking for a job, and only keeps messing up and being goofy and awkward and fidgety. The game also treats Bayonetta's name as some sort of dumb, important name that gets passed down the family or something stupid like that. I guess this retroactively means Rosa was also called Bayonetta by the game's logic. Man, this is dumb. Imagine if at the end of DMC5 after Nero has done nothing but lose and lose and progress in reverse, Dante goes, alright kid, now it's your turn to protect the world, also you are Dante now. And then, to top it all off and make the entire experience all the more jarring, you get the true final dance sequence with all the characters you watched horribly die like an hour ago. Fantastic. This is worse than a bad story and characters. This is a story that actively does everything it can to ruin its own characters. I actually liked Viola, you know? The idea of Bayonetta having a Nero-like character to mentor was actually very fun. Viola has such a different vibe from Bayonetta and Jean, but the game actively does nothing with her. It makes it seem like it does by telling you she's grown, but it's not true. And it actively disrespects her character by curve-stomping her in every single fight. It also actively disrespects all the other beloved characters we already know and love. Bayonetta herself has no real journey here, there's no closure. She's just there to save the world. Jean has to go fetch Sigurd, only to die a disrespectful death, rather than at least going out alongside Bayonetta at the end, in the final fight. Rodan does literally nothing either, and Luca for some reason takes all the glory and is a key player. When I came into Bayonetta 3, I expected a story on par with DMC5, but this isn't even on par with Bayonetta's previous games. I was looking forward to Bayonetta 3 for a very long time. This is a franchise that I loved a lot, and to say that this game disappointed me would be putting it lightly. It's extremely sad for me as a fan to see the franchise fall this low like this. And knowing that Camilla wants to do like a bunch of other Bayonetta games after this, already planning Bayonetta 4 and a brand new Bayonetta spin-off already announced which seems to be more story focused than other Bayonetta games. I, I really have no idea what he's thinking. Platinum really needs to recognize where their strengths shine. Platinum managed to create a great game in collaboration with Kojima's team back when they made Metal Gear Rising. Platinum shines best when they focus entirely on delivering a satisfying, high-octane spectacle full gameplay and leaving the story and writing and characters for someone who knows what they're doing. Someone like Bingo Morihashi, who actually co-wrote Bayonetta 2 and was the main writer for DMC3, DMC4, and DMC5. I've said it before, and I'll keep saying it. When these games actually have a good writer who knows what they're doing and treats the characters as characters, these games are more than just great action games. They're great games overall. And I wanted that for Bayonetta 3. But unfortunately, that's not what happened. In any case, uh, this video has probably gone longer than I anticipated it to. It's not exactly the most organized video. There are surely lots of things I must have left out or things I could have written and organized better. But my disappointment was so big that I, I simply needed to let this out in one way or another. I don't think there's more I can say here that I haven't already said, so I'll just do as I always do and take a moment to say that I'm mainly an artist and I just do these videos for fun. So if you want to go check out my art, I'll leave all my links in the description. Anyways, thanks for watching all the way to the end, go play Devil May Cry 5, and goodbye.